Hi, I'm Meta Spencer. I think we ought to reform the United Nations, don't you? I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done to fix up that wonderful organization. It started off great, but there are things that we know now that should be done to make it a little better. So I'm going to talk today with someone who has a lot of thoughts about this. Uh, her name is Drea Klein Bergman. And I think you live here in Toronto, I believe. Uh, she is the uh, executive director of the Progressive World Federalists. She has a master's of science in public policy from the United Nations Hi. University in the Netherlands. You have um, been involved with um, a project in which you have young people modeling the United Nations. I gather a UN structured differently along the lines that you'd like to see the real UN uh, redesign. So where, where shall we start? Shall we talk about world federalism or shall we talk about the United Nations first? Because, you know, they're clearly related. The world federalists have always been trying to figure a way to, to make a world government work. Only they don't always like that word. <laughs> yes. yes. You know, I, I think actually for me, they're absolutely intertwined. Um, so, you know, I came to world federalism really late in life. Um, I was in my late 30s before I got involved in it. So I had gone through most of my life and, and my undergraduate work and all the, the degrees that I got my undergraduate, not knowing anything about it, not really like knowing about the United Nations, but nothing really in depth. I started traveling and uh, living abroad. I met people. And I suddenly had this fascination of like, I need to know more. This is my small little world isn't enough here. Uh, so I went to and got my master's abroad. Uh, and it was one of the masters was through the United Nations University. So I got really in depth into the United Nations. And it was, you know, I never really considered how utterly flawed and undemocratic this system is. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see the dots of how it connected to me and my life, sadly. And I got really frustrated and I got discouraged and I really didn't know what to do with all of that. And I was doing research for the UN and I didn't want to be part of that system. I'm sorry, you were doing research for the UN. You mean you were employed yes. at the UN? No. So what we, um, one of the benefits of being in graduate school at the UN University is that you get asked to do certain projects that the UN is undertaking. Mm -hmm. And because my interest was evaluation, I did a lot of evaluation work. So I would evaluate UN programs. And none of them were doing what they are in, were intended to do. Mm. And no one was interested in really fixing the situation. So that was, again, where uh, more of my frustration came in. So then it wasn't until this time that I was actually introduced to world federalism and understanding that, okay, there are reform ideas out there. There are a ton of people in you know, thousands of people involved in every country around the world that are interested in reforming the UN. And maybe this is where I should put my energy. So that's where I started, you know, getting into this idea. Again, it was just 10 years ago. It's very, I'm very, very new to the organ, you know, to the movement. And then I was offered a position uh, back in the States back in the United States to direct a model UN program. And I, I don't know, I took it because I thought here's an opportunity for me to dig a little bit further into this and to understand what my role in this world is. And it was really difficult to not be inspired by these students. They are so, so passionate about global governance and all of these issues that we're facing, right? That I mean, this is the, an, an opportunity that, that they don't normally have. They were, and I'll explain the program in a little bit, uh, but they're engaged in these global issues, taken seriously, given a space 
to be able to come up with their own ideas to solve solutions. And that doesn't come up in, in normal school day-to-day -day things, right? Now, there are some issues with Model UN, and I don't let me not talk about that. Um, it's accessibility issues. So th this is not offered usually through curriculum. These are after school. I, when I was in high school, it would have been 1948. I was in a Model UN program uh, in Los Angeles. I remember, and I can't remember what country I was, but I believe I represented some country or other. <laughs> so it isn't, it isn't just a, a brand new idea, but it certainly never got a lot of um, attention. As far as I know, I have vaguely, I hardly remember what went on there, naturally, in 1948. But, <laughs> but uh, and I don't think there were many places that did it, but, but, but there were different schools from Southern California that came together in Los Angeles. Uh -huh. Okay, go exactly. on. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, let me just talk about the program really quick. So it goes on in, it can go on in middle school, depending on where you're at, it can take place in high school and even on the college level. And this is all over the globe. And according to the UN stats, about 400,000 students per year participate in the program. So that's where I think we have some serious accessibility issues. And until we fix those accessibility issues, you know, Model UN is not gonna save the world to borrow from your title of your program. Uh, so we, we do have some problems with that because, mo you know, unfortunately, most schools and universities haven't taken up Model UN as part of their curricula. They're after school clubs. They cost money. So for low income students, there are severe barriers. And most Model UN clubs also travel to Model UN conferences. So imagine the transportation costs. Imagine the hotel costs and the food costs and registration costs to participate in these conferences. You know, if it can cost up to, you know, thousands of dollars to participate in one conference. Uh, so there is that issue. And, and so when we're talking about how many participate, 400,000 doesn't seem like a lot for a global program that has been running for so long. Uh, so, so anyways, th those are my issues with the program, but Meta, I would say, even though you don't remember the experience, I would say that it's definitely been impacted because look at what you're doing now with your life. Like this is, this is truly inspiring for me. And this is what I've seen in students over and over again, because of what you do in the program. So you are assigned a country, you are given a topic to debate and discuss and then you have to spend months prior to this conference researching the topic, the culture, the, the government, the system that you're supposed to represent. And you go as a delegate representing this country. And then you have to debate with all of these other delegates that you've probably never met before. Mm -hmm. And you have to, and you're given in these simulations, just like in the United Nations. So you could be put in a general assembly committee. You could be put in a security council committee. Um, and there's, you know, think of all of the UN committees. And those are all mock simulations that could happen at a model UN conference. Uh, some conferences are single day, some are multi-day. Again, if the multi-day conferences, then the costs continue to add up. So again, another accessibility issue. Um, but the inspiring part and why I have never left Model UN is because I have watched it develop and instill in these students that have never participated in before. Not only do they want to come back the next year, but they are, we are shaping global citizens. And this is something truly remarkable. And we're shaping global citizens who learn about human rights and want to uphold them. They you know, are engaged in these global issues and then they have to look at what's going on in their local community and their national level and an international level very, very differently 
because they've been given this, you know, inside um, avenue to what's how these systems work and how they connect to them personally. And so that's what's really exciting for the Model UN program. It really does shape global citizens. Mm -hmm. Are are you now uh, holding model conferences in which you pretend that the UN structure is is the way you want it to be rather than the way it is? Yes, I am so glad you brought that up, Meta, because um, that is another one of my issues with Model UN is that it it doesn't really push students to think critically beyond the status quo that we're currently in. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to take this a little bit further and challenge students a little bit more. And, you know, I was just fortunately um, crossed paths with the Workable World Trust at the time a few years ago. And they wanted to do just that. Now, the Workable World Trust was started by um, the late, great Dr. Joe uh, Schwartzberg, and he was a professor at the University of Minnesota. And he was also a world federalist, and he spent his entire life and his work was revolved on how can we practically reform the UN to make it democratic, to make it sustainable, to make it so every voice matters and that we are not in this current status quo of uh, with the Security Council and the P5. So the idea was very simple at the time. Okay, so take some of these reform ideas and turn them into a committee at a UN conference. So we were very fortunate that the Mexico City International Conference, it's called MIMAN, uh, took us up on this offer And so the very first year we ran the pilot and it was for the General Assembly. It did not work at all. (laughs) Students understand what was going on. They hated it. It was just an utter, utter disaster. Um, And so we just decided, you know, but my mom loved having us there. And we just decided to regroup. Okay, what could we do for reform that students could grasp right away and that we could, you know, do some training beforehand? And the Security Council is a really easy one to grasp. And so imagine going to a Security Council conference and you're a P5 and you don't get your your veto power vote because that's one of the first things to go, right? I couldn't okay. guess that would be the first thing that would go. <laughs> exactly. And watching the students in one of the P5s, like, what? I, I don't have ultimate power to decide what's happening here? Um, it, it was just amazing watching this transformation and they loved it. And so much so that we had to have, I'm gonna call it a debrief after the conference because they wouldn't leave. (laughs) They wanted to talk about the Security Council and all of these issues that they had never considered before. And, And it was just an amazing experience. And so not only does this type of thing work as far as being able to introduce this to the model UN world, but it, it really, they wanted more. And it was very, very exciting. Now, do I think that Security Council reform to this level will ever happen in my lifetime? Probably not. Uh-oh. Uh, but, you know, the point really is to get as many people as possible to examine our status quo. And if we can get more people involved on this platform, um, you know, I've seen some amazing things happen when we collaborate collectively. Okay, but now let's issues. talk about what what other changes you would make or have made since then in your vision of the way the UN should work. Because I've got a few <laughs> a few ideas of my own, and I expect everybody yes. you, re- you have this conversation with has some suggestions too. Anyway, what in addition to getting rid of the uh, veto, uh, would you uh, propose and have you been trying out with your model? Yes, absolutely. So this is a great question because when you think about, um, especially the Security Council uh, and how undemocratic it is and how many countries have been left 
out of the Security Council. So what were what would happen if every single country would have voting power in some capacity on the Security Council? So another route, yeah, it's it's it kind of blows your mind a little bit when you think about it. But uh, another I, a reform idea is okay. We break down votes by region. These regions would be grouped together, and then there would be calculations based on population, um, UN contribution, a constant, and that would be your weighted vote. Okay, hold on. Um, now, the, these regions would be like North America, South America, Africa, or or what? What? What do you mean by a region? So it depends on which reform we're talking about here, because there's so many different reform ideas here. Now, Joe Schwartzberg decided, um, because he was a geographer, so he was deeply embedded into all of these regions and studying them. Um, And I have some disagreements on what he proposed, by the way, and I'll talk about that for in a minute. Um, But he, you know, based on population, um, so the United States actually was in its own region. China is its own region. India is its own region. And then you have like uh, South American countries would be a region, right? So he thought based on geography, based on culture. Now, the Middle East was an interesting thing that he decided. Israel, because it's a democracy, would never work in the Middle East and all the conflict there. So he put Israel in Europe. And I can tell you when we ran the student simulations, that did not work. Students did not like that. Um, and, uh, and this was, a, you know, a number of years ago, he proposed this, he put Ukraine in with a region with Russia. Again, today, that does not work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and we're in the middle of this crisis right now with Russia uh, wanting to invade Ukraine. So there are some serious flaws with these ideas. Uh, and they need to be hashed out. They need to be talked about and debated. And I think Model UN is the perfect place for that. Um, I, 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 don't I, I don't even like the basic idea. I, I'm not sure that I think geographical areas, regions are immutable. Uh, you know, a, a culture is, it can flip. I mean, it is probably was true that 25 years ago, I know it was true because I had Ukrainians who came and lived with me and they were Russians for, you know, all practical purposes. They were part of the Soviet Union and Russia was the Soviet Union. And, you know, it was it was there was no issue. And it, I remember when it be, nationalism arose among my Ukrainian youth friends and they began to think I'm a Ukrainian. Well, you know, that was important all of a sudden. And and these things can flip, you know. Yes. I mean, it's all yes. in the mind as as a, what, who was this guy who said called nationalism imagined communities? It's all imaginary, you know. I mean, yeah, yeah, we sometimes it seems very compelling that you feel you couldn't be anything except a, a particular identity group, you know, but you know. but it, it you certainly don't have to be and and you know there there are uh, points of view that actually make it make it uh, the objective to overcome these you know regional or cultural identities and sort of be global in in your identity so i i wouldn't i wouldn't i already mr schwartzberg go away i, I don't like that idea <laughs> and uh, the reason why i'm actually agreeing with you on this is because uh, with democracy in such rapid decline, and with, as you mentioned, nationalism on the rise, frighteningly. Um, I mean, look at France's federal elections that are coming up next year, and we have Le Pen back in the, the, the game now that could become president of France. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't believe that regions work any longer in this current state of chaos and um, and our but, but, decline but, but, of democracy. Let's, let's play with the alternative though, because you know, with with Le Pen, for example, it, it would be anti-immigrants or something. But uh, and, also, she would she would leave the EU 
That's on, that's her agenda. Okay. She would leave the but, EU. But and, most, <clears throat> most of these, you could say um, you treat all Muslims as a community, as Trump did. You know, Muslims are out. We don't like Muslims. Yeah. Or, you know, uh, Mexicans We or, you know, Latin Americans are, are out. <clears throat> so that treats them as a, a, a cultural entity, which they may not have thought they were, but it, it creates it. And, and it, it's mostly very unhelpful, I think. So can we get beyond, you know, my, my vision of a, of, a, of a world governance, of whatever it might, structure it might take, would be one in which I'd like to get, frankly, away from nation states, period, as well as these uh, ethnic or religious or um, national identities. You know, if I were saying this in Quebec, I would look over my shoulder to make sure nobody's too mad at me for it. But, right. uh, but that's, I think, in, in, in the long term, that's the way to go, is try to overcome it, not try to build on it. Well, and, you know, the nation state is so deeply flawed. Uh, this idea of the nation state. And it's certainly not playing out well in, on the UN scale. And that's affecting all of us so gravely. Um, how do we get away from that? How do we get from here to there? I wish I had answers for that. It's um, frightening how much people are clinging to their power and clinging to this status quo. So I, I have no answers at this point. I have um, been tearing my hair out over <laughs> global Look, politics. Let's, let's, let's play with this. Don't, you know, in, in Poland, for example, when they were trying to overcome, when Solidarity and these other groups were trying to overcome the communist regime, they would set up a parallel government that was outside, you know, it was just like a, you know, you've got your government. Well, we've got we've created this thing the way we want it to be. And, and they even printed their own stamps and put them on letters. And sometimes they uh, the post office would put the stamps through accepting the, the, the you know, et cetera. So uh, they they simply ignored the structure that was there. I mean, they, they didn't try to do anything to oppose it, but but they just set up an alternative. And I'm thinking. You know, if, if you want a new kind of world government, you cannot do it by tearing down the UN. And I don't think I would want Agreed. to, or, you know, but yes. uh, but what you could do is set up a, another one the way you want it to be and get everybody, as many people on board, et cetera, until it gathers, uh, you know, uh, uh, gravity, uh, uh, you know, um, sort of the way they did the... Um, you know, the Ottawa process uh, went around the UN treaty uh, building uh, procedure by getting countries together outside the UN or outside the, the usual uh, structures and separately created this uh, landmines treaty, which that model has been adopted and, and followed a few times since then. And I think that's sort of the idea behind it. I don't think that, the, you know, I wouldn't want to try to overcome the UN or uh, you overcome the, the governments, national governments, but let's find some other way of doing things and show that it works better. And, you know, um, this, what you're suggesting is very similar to, have you heard of the organization Democracy Without Borders? No. Sounds okay. Like I think you should. They are fabulous. I am absolutely, I adore everything that they're doing. This is exactly their sort of premise. They're, they're not advocating to get rid of the UN. And, and, and let's face it, they're still the only organization doing these, these things on a global scale. Like we don't have anybody else, right? Um, so I agree with you. I don't want to get rid of the UN at all. Um, but they're, they um, see how undemocratic it is and how do we get more people involved? How do we get a say in what happens at the UN? So there's this um, movement called the United uh, Nations Parliamentary Assembly. 
Oh, and this, maybe maybe we're working toward the same thing. I have on my desktop yes. a little folder called in which I put things about I, my ideas for a parliamentary assembly. Go on. <laughs> so what you're saying is exactly the UNPA, uh, which is really really exciting. It's it is you know we bring more citizens involved from all over the world that actually can make change. And so they're working towards making this an actual branch within the UN, but again, with a completely separate governance system that is democratic. Mm -hmm. So how that all plays out, I don't know. This is the first time I have seen, at least in the last 10 years I've been involved with this, that I can actually see it happening. Um, so I'll share with you the, the website for that because it's, it's really, really uh, fascinating. It's amazing. It's, it it um, keeps me going when I get really discouraged mm -hmm. over um, what feels like the world on fire, right? Because it feels like we can make some inroads mm -hmm. and we can, we can do something with this. But Meta, you're, you're brilliant. <laughs> well, listen, here's, here's, I, I'll be I'm really keen to find out what kind of structure they have. But my structure is... Everybody, about half of the population of the world now has a cell phone. And that means you have an email address and you could use your cell phone for voting. And you could, and what instead of having constituencies where you elect people for your nation to represent you at the UN, I would have people, my birthday is August 29th. I would have everybody in the world who, whose birthday is August 29th, elect somebody to represent us in the parliamentary assembly. And of course the elector, electoral campaigning could go on by cell phones. And, and the obvious thing would be when they have meetings, the, 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 the delegates are giving their speeches on cell phones. So everybody in the world can watch what goes on if they want to and form committees that do it electronically. And so, I figure, I, I, honestly, if if Bill Gates would give me uh, about fifty million dollars, I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> Is that all? Bit. That's all we need. We can do that. <laughs> I think we can start a campaign, Meta. <laughs> <laughs> So what is the structure that these folks have in mind about how, how you would elect people? Uh, what would be a constituency for a delegate to the parliamentary assembly, given the no, system you're promoting? I'm going to actually go right on their website here because uh, I don't want to get anything wrong. So they're suggesting um, to give popularly elected representatives this formal role within the UPA uh, or UNPA. And so they would have direct represent, uh, they would directly represent the world's citizens. And so this would not be through any government system. Um, but this is the thing, Meta, I think is different than from what you were suggesting. So member states could choose um, their N UNPA members um, and then reflect political spectrum. So they're, they're hoping that this would make it more diverse. Um, and all members are directly elected. But again, this is through still through the um, mm. the member state system. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. And in fact, that the people who are really trying to make over the UN by adding a third house, the parliamentary assembly, generally say that well, we couldn't have direct elections right away. The people don't will not go to the polls to vote for somebody to represent them directly at the at the parliamentary assembly but what we could do is recruit people who were already elected uh, parliamentarians in their own country so each country would get a certain number of parliamentary uh, parliamentarians <clears throat> who would be representing them in the i don't like that that's 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 a good starting point if that's all you can do but i think it's it'd be easier to start over right <laughs> right i i mean the, I think, too, that um, there's a lot of ideas out there that can get muddled along the way and compromises get made along the way as well. 
Um, so what you end up as like, well, we're going to be more democratic and then things get kind of shuffled to the to the wayside. So that's what I'm kind of worried about with the, this idea of the UMPA. How democratic will it remain? Um, it's still, like I said, the, it's still based on our member states and who gets elected from the member states. So there's, I think, some issues with that. Yeah. Um, I would too. <laughs> okay. Has anybody uh, has anybody tried? I mean, with your model UN, have you been trying a parliamentary system, <clears throat> assembly system? Oh, you know what? This is. I'm so glad you asked that. Um, so our colleagues with the Workable World Trust. Um, so it's another organization, I believe, in Brazil. Uh, I can't remember the name of the organization right now. They had this idea to do a model UNPA. They did it virtually this past year, um, actually in India. And I'm so glad that they were able to pivot and do it online because everything's changed now with COVID. There's the idea of you being able to go to in-person conferences. It's right now um it, everybody's you know they change they have it like everybody's scheduled right now for in-person conferences starting in january even in vancouver like i don't think that's going to happen oh, yes. um, okay for right the so um but they were able the, to the, the npt review is that what you're Referring or is there another thing? No, these are mod. These are like so. Universities will host model UN conferences on the college level, mm -hmm. and then they so they have these every year where they host all across Canada. And I, the um, British Columbia University of British British Columbia has one of the biggest ones, and they actually scheduled for in person for January, and I don't see that happening now. Um, and a lot of the, like the, the, one of the longest standing conferences, uh, model UN conferences runs in New York. It's called the um, N M U N N Y. And they actually are able to host model UN conferences in the United nations to give students that complete feel of being a, a real delegate. Mm -hmm. And they uh, have in-person scheduled for April of next year. Uh, but you know what? I think uh, there have been the I've been enjoying. I don't want to let, let anybody know how much fun I've had during the lockdown because you're not supposed to have fun. But these meetings that I've been doing, these conversations like this one have been, the, you know, one of the high points of my life. I've just loved I my social life is 10 times better than it ever was because I get to talk to you and every day somebody new. But the beauty is these webinars are, you know, a lot of them are really dull and they're not very well done, but you could do a much more democratic kind of uh, debates and committee meetings and all of that stuff so that anybody in the world could be listening in and you could have meetings, it, you know, you could do it with so much more easily by uh, electronic means now than, than these travels to, to the to the UN and New York and so on. So exactly. I think that the the wonders of, of the cell phone or the tablet or something, it's really something that it puts us in a different situation altogether. We could have a much better functioning. The only thing that throws me though is, and this is true when I find uh, trying to organize a, a, a committee that's worldwide, the time zones. You know, yes. you can't have yes. people in Britain uh, at the same time as I have people in India. So yes. even though you don't divide the world up into nations, you're going to have to divide them up into segments of time zones or something. And I don't know how to get around that. I think it's really built into it. So we'll have, I, I, I mean, imagine having to have three different, uh, a committee with three different time zones, you know, exactly like three different, you could, you could get groups of people so that some people you could make them get up at nine o'clock and other people could be in on the thing at 9 PM, but you can't really ask people to get up at 3 AM. So you've right. got to have at least three segments of the world where all the time zones in that area function together. But then how do you have say the committee on, you know, refugees or something, and you've got, 
three different committees working sort of separately. I haven't figured that out. So, you know, this is um, MIMON, the Mexico City International Conference, they were able to pivot online last year, which was really great. Um, and also, I just want to add, putting things online takes away this accessibility issue. It makes it more affordable and anyone with a computer and internet connection actually can participate in these conferences, whereas before it would take thousands of dollars, right? So that's what I love about, you know, with the shift with COVID and, and I'm seeing possibilities for even low income students to participate now. So you have all of this um, um, idea, you know, you can have separate committees running all simultaneously. So students can be put in all of these different committees and we're calling them breakout rooms for Zoom purposes so that they can all be working together um, on the computer at the same time. Um, now, what we're missing um, with this virtual uh, world versus in conference is you would as a student be able to go in and see all of the different committees and you would have interactions with the other committees that you just don't aren't able to have in the in the virtual world. And also on your off time, the students that you would meet, you would go and have lunch with and things like that, and you would be able to talk and continue working. So there's a couple of things that are missing in the virtual world that you get in person. Um, but I really, really love this accessibility issue. And, and it is time, the time zone is an issue. I'm having that as well, especially with Europe. Um, I, um, they're ready to go to bed when I'm ready to have a meeting. So uh, we do, I do Europe, like your- Europe is a whole lot easier though than Asia. You know, yes. when I try to talk to somebody in Australia, or set up a meeting. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's really one of us is going to lose some sleep. <laughs> right, yeah. and and you know um, what I I think what's interesting about that when when countries or a university hosts a model UN conference in the past and you would travel to that, then you would all be on their time zone. So and that's how the virtual model UN conferences are playing out you then have to adapt to their time zone wherever you are at in the world. So it's again, like, I like your idea better. Meta, you have just brilliant, brilliant ideas where you can have three different kinds of uh, time zones so that you can still navigate in this. Well, I think there's it's some, some idea that you could record these things. I mean, point is that you want people in all, let's say you have the world in three sectors of, of time zones, but you'd, you'd want the people in all the other two sectors to be able to listen to the one. So you could record it. And then they could listen to it at their own uh, timing. But of course, watching a recording is not the same as being there and able to put your hand up and, and yell at somebody. Yeah. Right. And, and, and that's the, the beauty of a Model UN conference, whether it's a reform committee or whether it's just your regular Model UN conference, um, is that you can live participate because you do have to write resolutions. You do have to debate. You do have to, you know, publicly speak and get your point across and follow the, the rules that they have in place. So, I mean, watching a Model UN conference uh, is not the same as participating. And what you get out of, of those is completely different from you actually having to do the work and you having to do the research. And then, you know, you're forced in this situation versus just watching is you have to figure out a way to collaborate with someone that doesn't have the same opinion as you, right? When you're representing these, these two very different countries, for example. Um, and so you do have to learn these negotiation skills. And if you are just watching as a participant, it's fun to watch, but you don't have to sort of, you know, learn to those skills that are necessary with that, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just while you were saying, I, I just thought of a good argument in my own favor. So <laughs> my own favor now is I'm, I'm a, it looks like I'm on a campaign to get this thing to happen. I don't know. Anyway, you know, I one, of the, one, of, one of my uh, actual concerns about the failures of democracy now is that 
<clears throat> voters are so stupid. And, and, you know, you, this is really a problem. How do you get around the fact that, you know, a good part of the world's population do not believe that COVID vaccines are good for you or believe that, uh, you know, whatever. They believe nuclear weapons are, are, are really what we need to keep us safe or uh, uh, vote for Donald Trump. You know, there are people who believe in really crazy things. And to me, this is the, the really distressing thing, watching democracies that are truly democracies. It's not that they're... It's not that they're not sufficiently democratic. It's that they are very democratic and people get elected who shouldn't be elected and they make terrible decisions. They don't believe in climate change, for example, and they're not doing the right things and so on. So all of this is bad. And I put it all down to group dynamics that the, you know, uh, uh, back in the 70s, there was a guy named Irving Janis who wrote the stuff about groupthink that when you get groups of people together, they all want to get along in their group. And so they will kind of change their points of view to fit in whatever other people are saying. So they'll go along with, and so you get a, a, a mentality or an ideology developing in a group that people wouldn't independently have come up with if you were asking them, but they're part of, they're part of a herd or they're part of a, a group dynamic. And that is, to me, a really problematic thing, that that will happen wherever you have a real democracy. That's going to be a real problem, I think. So one of the things that Janice pointed out was that John Kennedy screwed up. He got the, you know, he made the, the Bay of Pigs uh, muddle, which just fiasco, terrible. And he was led into that by going along with his security not security council, but his committee, whatever, advisors, they, I've forgotten what they're called. And they had a, this dynamic going where every, nobody wanted to say, look, this like, looks to me like a goofy idea. Are you sure? You know, nobody would challenge it. So they went along with this stupid idea, which didn't work. Later, when the Cuban Missile Crisis arose, what he said was, we need to break them up into separate groups. <clears throat> so we have three different subcommittees of this one body and mm. independently <clears throat> they all consider the issue of what to do about the cuban missile crisis you know the russians and so on and <clears throat> then we'll after they've come up with their advice then we i have three different things so <clears throat> they're probably going to come up with different advice but it's good to have all three working separately so that then maybe i can get over the problems of group dynamics in each one, because we'll see, we'll have some basis for comparison. So let's say we have a committee at the UN on, uh, let's say, nuclear disarmament, because that's my favorite topic. And, and, and there's a lot of there's a lot of model UN uh, debates on that, by the way, over the years. Oh, so yeah. they're, they're heavily yeah. in that. <clears throat> so <clears throat> so we have three time sectors. And all of these diff three time zones have their own committee on nuclear disarmament. And then when they get them all, all three uh, working more or less independently, although they can look at each other, they won't be subject maybe to the same dynamics of as if they were in one community. You can make some comparisons of the, of the three and possibly overcome some of the problems. So here's my, that's my, my rationale for saying maybe uh, having three separate time zone sectors would be right. some beneficial aspects. And, you know, what I found too is um, at the various model UN conferences that I have been at um, over the years is that each group is a little bit different in what they come up with their solutions. And they are, um, some of them are just, you know, following the herd, as you had said, but there are some that are very independent, have really brilliant ideas that don't give up and don't back down. Um, and it's really great to see what these young kids can come up with on how to solve these issues. 
And you do see that um, in every single conference and every every single committee, there's just one group that's a little bit different. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, I, and I love that. And, and because of the working groups that naturally evolve in these conferences, you will see four or five working committees in a larger, like the General Assembly, doing exactly what you have just suggested, mm-hmm. which is remarkable. Okay, good. Okay, so where where are you going with this whole thing? You you must have some aspiration for how to take this model UN thing to another level. Where where are you going with it? So, I mean, you, you talked about wanting fifteen million dollars <laughs> and having this supply of money. So, if I had. $50 million given to me, and I in resources weren't a question, I would love to make Model UN more accessible. And I would love this to be part of a curriculum and not just Model UN, but again, these reform ideas. And Joe Schwartzberg is just one individual with reform ideas. There are so many reform ideas on the table. Of course, they've been tabled at the UN year after year after year after year. Um, But to show, you know, just to have students at all levels in middle school, high school and college, um, well, college is a little bit different, right, because they're paying for their courses. Um, But to have this as part of their curricula in in civics and social studies, uh, even in geography to so that they can learn these things early on, that would be my dream. Um, Now, is this. uh, an achievable wish. I don't know. Is the reforming the Security Council an achievable wish? I don't know. Um, it's going to take political will, which I don't think we have. Um, it's going to take a ton of resources and a ton of people that are committed to this. And unfortunately, we just don't have all three of those things. But we do need opportunities for students to become engaged in this manner. And and that is something that like, unless you have these clubs that are already in your schools, it's very difficult to do this on this level. Um, And of course, again, the accessibility, these cost money. So my ideal world, this would be part of a curricula all across Canada. This would be free and accessible. Teachers are trained in this so they know how to teach it. Um, if they do it, let's say all the high schools had such a program and the kids learn how the system works or how it should work using whatever model you, you invent, how are you going to get from there to having those people now demand real changes in the UN? Because to me, that's the interesting point is this is not just to play games, although from my experience, it was just a a terrific outing and kind of learned how to debate a little bit and things like that. But it's not a personal, it's not a, it's not just equivalent to a ski trip. It it should be having some future impact on actually how we run world governance. And God knows we need some changes urgently. I mean, the, uh, I, I just really worry about climate change as, as, uh, nuclear weapons too. That's always always there. But the the methane clothrates melting in the Arctic and so on uh, is really serious. And there's no- I'm losing sleep. I'm losing sleep. Right over this. Too. And uh, well, I lose sleep because I'm old. I mean, that's that's what happens when you get to be ninety. You don't sleep very well, but it, it's okay. I I uh, I make up for it in other ways. But at any rate, think is you know. It, 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 there's nobody in the world who's able to manage this thing. They can't do this IPCC and they can't do it. In fact, they're, they're two or three years behind every time they put a, open their mouths. They, they say things that were true maybe three years ago, maybe, but not true anymore. And or right. they're, they're not adequate as an explanation of what's going on. And you go to Glasgow and, and it's a toothless, you know, the, there's no, uh, there's nothing to make, uh, any significant difference. And so wasn't it the other day, the UN, uh, the General Assembly had a resolution about indicating that climate change and security are connected and, and, and Russia vetoed it? 
Was it at the UN? Yes. <laughs> yes. I, 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 I can hardly yes. remember it because I can't believe yes. it's true. But yes, 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 they would veto a resolution that, saying there's any such connection between security and climate change. Oh. Yes. Okay. I, I know. I know. It's just this is why I'm ripping out my hair on the on the weekly basis here. You know, I I think um, well, my experience with working with with kids these last you know eight years in these programs is that they really are hungry for more, and so they would come up and ask, you know, where can we get involved to do this? And so just creating a list of resources. It's not that for me. I I, I did it on the fly, and then I realized it was much more needed, right? But they 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 want to take action. They want more. And I'm talking about 90% of the students that I dealt with. Really? Uh, yes. And they just didn't have a um, where to go because no one's, you know, these are, this is a direct pipeline. And when you say UN, yes, that's important too. But a lot of students were questioning what was going on in their city council. And on the local level, and how do I get involved with that? What do I, you know, these basic questions that no one is really, they didn't take the time and no one has helped mentor them in that Okay, direction. but after they do the model you in, what else have you got? I mean, they, they go home and there's nothing for them to do. There's a follow on from the model you in, is there? <clears throat> So the, your, the answer to your question is no, there, that's been my problem as well. You're just, you, you are pinpointing my, my issues with Model UN as well. So unfortunately, like I'm just one person and it's just been me sort of guiding these students that are approaching me, like, what else can I do? I want to take action. I want to be part of this. Um, but they are hungry. They want to take action. They want more. Um, and I don't think there's enough people mentoring them and guiding them where, you know, and I can't tell them what to do or where to go. I give them a list of every possible resource I, I can find. And they have to do all of the follow-up work on that. And they have to contact these organizations and they have to get involved. And because of all of the work that they do with Model UN, for them to take those next steps is actually not that difficult for them. They just need that, you know, here's a list from A to Z of what you can do. What are your interests? Yeah, my and it's experience is a little different. In 10 that. minutes, right? And figuring yeah. that out with them. I, I don't think that it works to try to, well, mentor is a good word, but uh, I taught peace studies for 15 years or more. And, uh, and I taught several thousand students and they never became peace activists. Because young people are at a stage in life where if they organize their own activities, their own projects, their own uh, or, uh, campaigns and so on, that's fine. They'll be interested for however long that campaign is going on. But trying uh, all the old people keep trying to recruit young people into the, their existing organizations, and it just doesn't work. They want to do things on their own. But, you know, they don't have the the, the place to go to do that. So it, instead of trying to take these people who've been through the model you in and draw them into some existing NGO, uh, like the World Federalist, for example, I mean, not to pick on you, but you know, uh, oh, any, I, any, uh, group, any group that would, yeah. would be the next step. Logically, they might be theoretically the next step of activism, but they won't go there because it's like joining an old folks group and that's just not it. But if there were a post UN model organization so that the people, them, the young people themselves who had been involved with the model UN could continue some ongoing um, development a collective movement that they would own rather than have you or me own it and tell them what to do. I think maybe that would have some traction. What do you think? I love this idea. I absolutely, it's, it's almost like building a toolkit where they can go and run with it themselves. Um, and, and my issue 
with world federalism and other NGOs is exactly what you just pinpointed. It is a bunch of really older people. <laughs> and I think differently. Um, I use technology differently. And I get frustrated a lot. Um, and I think it would be great that they could have their own space to be able to just run with things. I love it. How do we do that? Let's do let's do this, Meta. <laughs> I have too many ideas that I can't implement. It's <laughs> for you, Drea. It is, this is your baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've given me food for thought. I absolutely love this idea. I think it's really important. And I'm going to run this by some people. You have this thing called progressive world federalists. So maybe that's your toolkit for how to make it happen. I don't know. Um, no, yes and no. I, I do like your idea of having something completely separate, right? And Because that would just be another arm and an organization we'd be sending them under. Um, I, I like this idea of, of this independent, I'm going to call it youth think tank. Okay. Of, of former model UNers that is hasn't doesn't have to be tied to any NGO. I, I like that much better, but I'm I'm crazy because I like this indep independent thinking kind of thing. So mm -hmm. <laughs> well you have to have them own it. You know, I think you have to actually talk to some young people who would like to start something like that. And then you can be in the background, but don't be out in front with the microphone. That's exactly. my advice, you know, they, that's, they need, and they, they thrive on an opportunity to really be, take charge. And uh, right. So that they can be the leaders in this. I love it. I love it. Well, this has been so much fun. Uh, uh, you know, yeah, I've been thinking, you, I, these are things I actually do think about a lot and, and I don't know where to go with it, but it sounds like you are, uh, you think about it and you have some ideas where to go. So that, that's, that's terrific. Now we just get somebody with deep pockets who <laughs> funds. Exactly. You know, I'll tell you what, you work on organizing the youth and I work on creating a parliamentary assembly in which people vote on their cell phones on their birthday. <laughs> oh, that sounds good. Uh, although if you're going to work on the, that, I want to work on that with you too. So oh, that's a deal. That's a deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay now do you have meetings you can here's a chance for you to to advertise since you're the executive director of this new outfit uh, let's conclude with you making a pitch for people to come to your meetings or whatever you want them to do well we are currently organizing right now um so it will be advertised probably on twitter and our website um, but we're working with um some people um, on developing some peace workshops in the coming year. So these are collective peace workshops um, that are um, not your typical ones where you sit back, they're um, participatory. They will be hosted from people from the country of conflict that we're gonna be talking about. Um, and again, I can't talk much about it right now because we're in development of this and I don't want to talk, you know, give too much away, but, um, it will be advertised. I think, I think in the next two to three months on our website, um, but we're, we're well, narrowing down. What's your website? Well, um, it's very long, but it's the exact title of your organization. So progressiveworldfederalists.com. It's a mouthful. All right. That's, that's memorable. I, I can, I can imagine doing that. Okay. That's good. And it's all here in Canada. This is a local initiative. Uh -huh. It's a local initiative. Um, we are narrowing down, like I said, we've got so many um, contacts from people from uh, all over the world. So we're not going to be getting like a policy expert from a university. We're going to be speaking to an expert that is on the ground um, usually they are women from the conflict region. And, and so we're looking at Rwanda, we're looking at Yemen, we're looking at Syria, like all, you know, the list goes on and on, unfortunately, right now, which breaks my heart. Uh, but, you know, we want to offer these free and accessible to everybody as long as you have a computer and an internet connection. That's wonderful. Good for you. So it's been fun. Let's stay in touch. You, you, yes, absolutely, you know, Meta. This is flowing. I'm ready to go. <laughs> I know it. Me too. Thank you, Meta. Okay. Take care. Have a happy Christmas. Thank you. You too. And this is episode 386. 
You can watch them or listen to them as audio podcasts on our website to save the world.ca. Eventually, we even post the transcripts there. And when you get to the website, do look around because we have conversations going on all the time about six global issues plus potential reforms in governance, economics, and civil society. To find a particular talk show that you want to see, enter its title or episode number in the search bar or the name of one of the guest speakers. And after you've watched or listened, scroll down and share your thoughts about the show with the other viewers. This is a place for dialogue, so please do join in. See you there.